afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone in joining this event, focusing on food nutrition security during COVID, the economic recovery and beyond. <clears throat> I'm Bill Hoagland here with the Bipartisan Policy Center, and I have had the pleasure to work with the staff on this issue, which has been a passion of mine for many years. On this one issue, ensuring that no family or child goes without food, you can set political affiliation aside. This is a bipartisan issue. And that is why when COVID burst onto the scene last year and we saw long lines of families lining up for food, we doubled down our work here at BPC on food and nutrition security. Last year and continuing today, we have seen federal, state, and local governments, nonprofits, churches, synagogues, mosques, food banks, shelters, and just simply neighbors stepping in to ensure that no one would go hungry in this, the richest country in the world. Last week's USDA's report indicating that overall low and very low food insecurity had not increased in 2020 from the previous year. I think that was a testament to this concerted uh, public-private partnership effort. However, the report also indicated that the benefits were not shared by all. Households of color and those with children did see an increase in food insecurity. In particular, in, in, in part because of that, BPC uh, brought together 18 very distinguished individuals with government experience from the agriculture and food processing and distribution sectors, from academia, uh, advocacy groups, and health and nutrition sectors. Time does not permit me to name all the 18. You will hear shortly, however, from the four distinguished co-chairs and a panel discussion with another four later in the program. The full list of the task force members uh, is listed on the first page of the brief we are issuing today and available at our BPC events website. The task force is continuing its work it will be issuing two more briefs, one later this fall, focused on the Federal Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act, and one early next year on the SNAP or the food stamp program leading up to the 2023 Farm Bill reauthorization. For now though, I want to introduce our very distinguished co-chairs of this project who have uh, some opening remarks. Uh, let me introduce them as a group. First, Secretary Dan Glickman, he was the 26th Secretary of Agriculture in the Clinton administration. Before that, he served 18 years in the House of Representatives representing the 4th District of Kansas. He has been the chairman of the Motion Picture Association of America and is just recently a first time author of Laughing at Myself, My Education in Congress on the Farm and at the Movies. Second, uh, Secretary Ann Veneman. She followed uh, Secretary Glickman. She is the 27th Secretary of Agriculture in President George W. Bush's administration. Importantly, though, also she served as the Executive Director of the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, the world's largest provider of vaccines and supporter of children's nutrition around the world. A sidebar, she was raised on a small peach farm outside Modesto, California, and joins us today, in fact, from California. Third, Leslie Saracen. She's the president and CEO of FMI, the Food Industry Association. She represents uh, the nearly $800 billion industry from food retailers, wholesalers, and suppliers in the vast interconnected food supply chain. She was most recently named the 2021 Association CEO of the Year. When the pandemic disrupted supply chains and grocery shelves, she and her team worked to connect food retailers across the world and made sure that the food industry was classified as part of the nation's essential workforce. And finally, but of course not least of least, the fourth co-chair, Chef Jose Andres, the renowned chef immigrated to the United States from Spain in 1991. He is a visionary and a humanitarian who established the World Central Kitchen in 2010 as a means of feeding those around the world and here in the US, particularly in times of natural disasters. He has only recently arrived back here in DC after providing much needed food assistance in Haiti and Louisiana and with the Afghan refugees. His mission statement is to change the world through the power of food. Let me now, before turning it over to Secretary Glickman, 
uh, give a shout out to all the BPC staff who have devoted so much time on this first brief and will continue to do so in the next many months. Dr. Anand Parak, our chief medical advisor here, Kevin Wu, Thomas Armuth, and our two cons consultants, Stephanie Hodges and Melissa Mer Meriton Shepherd, who uh, uh, Melissa will be moderating the panel with the four other task force members shortly. I also want to thank our communication staff, Lucy Manning and Mary Margaret Holden, and a production crew of Greg Gibson. In this world that we live in today of virtual events, these things don't happen easily without people like them making it possible. So thank you to all. So with that, let me turn it over to Secretary Glickman. Well, Bill, thank you and the team uh, very much. It's such a pleasure to join my co-chairs, Ann Veneman, Jose Andres, and Leslie Saracen, and the whole group of uh, task force members who are involved in food, health, nutrition, uh, and thought leaders. Uh, so as you said, Bill, this is the first of three reports the task force will be issuing over the course of the next several months. But today's focus is on the impact COVID-19 has had and is continuing to have on the lives of millions of Americans when it comes to making sure that no one suffers from being unable to put food on the table for their family. As presented in this report, we were issued today, and we will hear from the current Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, at the end of our four comments. The previous and current administration, uh, and along with bipartisan congressional action last year and earlier this year, stepped forward quickly to ensure every American and child had access to food, regardless of their economic situation. Importantly, the public support was bolstered by the tremendous support by, with respect to the nonprofits, particularly Chef Andre's World Central Kitchen and Claire Babineau Fontenot's Feeding America. So we had food banks, food shelters, local governments, religious organizations, private sector and companies, and just plain old neighbors helping neighbors to make sure that this work was being done. I think the concerted effort by so many last year was reflected in USDA's report last week that in 2020, at the height of the pandemic, the level of food insecurity was about 4% of all households, not significantly different than the previous 2019 non-pandemic year. Now that's the good news, but the bad news is that food security did increase for households with children in 2020, and the prevalence of food insecurity for households headed by a person of color increased to an alarming 22%. So we've made a lot of progress. Much still needs to be done to continue to address food security today in light of not only the pandemic, but all these weather catastrophes and disasters, and we need to be prepared for the next crisis that should befall us. So today's report provides bipartisan consensus recommendations, not only to access food and to address access, but quality and nutritious food throughout the pandemic, the current re economic recovery and beyond. So when you have 19 powerful voices, one should not be surprised if there are differing perspectives and experiences. We've had a healthy amount of debate in this process, but the group has held together on this first brief, in large part, Bill, because of your leadership and the leadership of the team, and I pray we can hold together on the next two to come. Before I turn this over to my colleague, Secretary Veneman, who will provide a high-level overview of the task force's recommendations today, I want to note that research has shown that people with diet-related conditions, such as diabetes, obesity, and heart disease are much more likely to experience severe outcomes from COVID-19. We try to draw that link in this report. We've had an opportunity to take the lessons learned from COVID-19 and the economic recovery and apply them to future public health emergencies and economic downturns, and for sure they will follow. So during the next 75 minutes, you will hear from my fellow co-chairs, remarks by Secretary Vilsack, and a panel discussion with four of our task force members. And then there will be an opportunity for Q&A with the panel members and co-chairs. And of course, you can use the chat box and you will be in informed on how best to uh, get your questions into BPC Live. So saying that, I'm going to finish and in introduce my successor at the Department of Agriculture, who had to clean my desk up when I left, and that is my friend Ann Veneman. 
Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Gl Glickman. Um, it is truly a pleasure to work with you through the Bipartisan Policy Center and on other issues uh, that we've had the opportunity to work together on. The policy recommendations in this first brief span four broad topic areas. Elevating food and nutrition security within the federal government. Second, federal food and nutrition programs, including recommendations across programs. Third, healthcare and community connections. And fourth, emergency food assistance. I want to emphasize that we are focusing not only on access to food, but food to improve the diets of not only recipients of federal feeding programs, but the population at large. So recommendations address both food and nutrition insecurity. Definitions are important here. Food insecurity defined by USDA is being uncertain of having or unable to acquire enough food because of insufficient money or resources. Nutrition insecurity is defined to mean lack of consistent access, availability, and affordability of foods and beverages that promote well being and prevent, and if needed, treat disease. The task force recommendations are one, develop standardized, fed, a standardized federal definition for nutrition security. Two, elevate policy issues related to food and nutrition security by hosting a White House conference on food, nutrition, hunger, and health in early 2022. Third, extend through the public health emergency or beyond the COVID-19 related nutrition program flexibilities and waivers. Ensure federal agencies have the authority to grant waivers and flexibilities during times of future economic downturns, recessions, and public health emergencies. Fourth, support an increase in accessibility, availability, and intake of fruits and vegetables in all forms in federal feeding programs. Five, ensure the necessary technology infrastructure is available to modernize service delivery. Six, ensure all individuals, especially those who are at disproportionate risk of food and nutrition insecurity, have equal access to affordable, nutritious foods to promote health. Seven, provide funding for federal research and programs that address food and nutrition security impacted by COVID-19. Eight, given the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, older Americans, and people with obesity and diet-related chronic conditions, design or modify existing programs to target these vulnerable populations. And finally, ninth, continue to provide program flexibilities and increase investments in emergency food assistance. During the panel that follows, the task force members will provide more detail on some of the specific recommendations. On a final note, the task force acknowledges that recommendations included in this report could add to federal spending beyond current law. Indeed, one of the recommendations is to moder modernize the thrifty food plan um, has, and that has just recently been adopted by the administration and will increase SNAP benefits an additional amount over the next decade. The report outlines these increased expenditures could be addressed without violating congressional budget protocol in various ways and identifies potential pay force through, though it does not endorse any specific one. Some of the task force recommendations could reduce future expenditures by improving health outcomes and reducing federal health care and other preventable costs. It is now my pleasure to turn this over to Leslie Sarenson, one of our co-chairs and the president of the Food Market Marketing Institute. Thank you, Secretary Veneman. It's been a pleasure to work with you and the other participants in the task force over recent months. 
As the Food Industry Association, FMI brings together a wide range of members across the value chain, from retailers who sell to consumers, to producers who supply the food, as well as a wide variety of companies providing critical services to the industry, all to amplify the collective work that the industry does. We at FMI support the broad recommendations outlined in this report that Secretary Veneman just went through with you. After all, we are in the business of making sure families have access to food that's safe, nutritious, and affordable. With Americans using grocery stores to stock up on essentials for their families, grocers have responded by ensuring their stores followed CDC guidelines to help protect their employees and customers. They rapidly shifted their business models to embrace technological advancements and partnerships to allow customers to be able to order online and pick up at the store or have groceries delivered to them in their homes. They committed to their workforces with increased flexibility, bonuses, benefits, and foundational jobs to support economic recovery in communities across the country. In total, the food retail industry's investment alone was $24 billion to keep America fed during the pandemic. Despite these challenges, we're extremely proud of the fact, for instance, that food retailers provided more than 1.5 billion meals to Americans in need through the Feeding America Network, the largest private donation stream to the organization in 2020, and supported billions more meals through our partnership with the federal government's Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Working together, this public-private partnership help stem what could have been even more families suffering food secure insecurity last year. The federal nutrition programs such as SNAP, WIC, and the school meals programs are crucial for promoting food and nutrition security, particularly among our nation's most vulnerable residents, such as children, seniors, and people with low incomes. And during times of economic hardship and greater need, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. We're especially proud of the work to help the program evolve to be available to customers who wanted to shop online and either pick up their order outside the store or have it delivered to their, to their homes. It's important to recognize that in a matter of months, the online SNAP pilot has gone from fewer than five participating states to 46 states and the Dis District of Columbia that enabled SNAP online purchasing for beneficiaries. A great deal of time and energy went into authorizing additional retailers to be able to accept SNAP online. And while this work wasn't front page news, it's been steadily progressing. Our businesses have taken every step possible to safely serve grocery shoppers and preserve jobs, even during the darkest moments of this crisis. And while it wasn't cha often challenging to find silver linings during these tur turbulent times, we still managed to find moments of gratitude as 86% of Americans are having in-person family meals as frequently or even more often than before the COVID-19 pandemic. The public and private sectors working together have been critical to the response. The federal government, charitable food system, nonprofit organizations and food industry all took actions that remain crucial to addressing food and nutrition security. Currently, we're working closely with USDA as a MyPlate national strategic partner to help highlight family meals and the family meal solutions from our members who have developed these, these opportunities and other partners to the program that include product suppliers, retailers, and community partners that are nutrient rich, affordable, and easy for all consumers to incorporate into their daily lives and their families. It's now my pleasure to introduce my fellow panelist, renowned chef and philanthropist, Chef Jose Andres. Thank you, Chef Andres, on behalf of a, I was gonna say a, a grateful nation, but frankly, a grateful world for all of the work you've been doing, particularly most recently in Louisiana as a result of the hurricane and with the Afghan ref refugees in Doha. Chef Andres. Thank you very much, uh, Leslie. It's been really uh, 
a joy working on this um, group with you, trying to move a smart policy uh, forward. So listen, guys, um, what can I tell you? Uh, for me, just watching Secretary Glickman, uh, Secretary Benjamin, uh, two people that work for two different administrations, but that when you saw talking about these recommendations we're bringing forward, was not about party, it was not about if one is right or left or Republican or Democrat, was about smart Americans bringing smart ideas forward. So uh, this is what all policy should be all about. Uh, we all know that there is a great urgency of now to follow through with the recommendations that we are bringing forward in today's brief. Listen, we cannot afford partisanship when it comes to food, to nutrition, and to hunger. And I'm so proud to say that the recommendations we are bringing is a smart policy with great recommendations that at the same time, we know, I know, that we have armies, armies of Americans with boots on the ground in the future to make those recommendations happen. That's the only way we will achieve change. So in red states, blue states, no matter our background, our religion, our beliefs, I do believe, I do believe you believe with me that we all have at least one thing in common. We all need food to survive, to thrive, and more than to thrive, to feed hope to every single American to every single family, especially to every single child and woman out there. I do believe that there is a moral imperative to ensure that again, no child, no family goes hungry and that we, and that they have access to healthy and nutritious food at the same time. Remember, people don't want our pity. People want our respect. Who, how do we provide them that respect? Food is a great way to start. You know, I had been all around the world very much with, with the NGO I founded with World Central Kitchen. Uh, most recently, as uh, my uh, co-chair, uh, Leslie Saracen mentioned in Haiti and Louisiana, um, helping people, you know, cope with disasters and, you know, making sure that they have simple access to food in the middle of the mayhem. Um, Food obviously is a basic need, especially in those moments. But, but I've learned that we must do more than you serving meals in the aftermath of emergencies. We must address the underlying inequalities that actually leaves communities hungry and vulnerable at, in the first place. And that's what we are here for, right? I do believe we all must forge the partnerships that can really empower families during normal times, as well in moments of crisis. Food and nutrition security should be available to all Americans, always. And I want to particularly emphasize the recommendation that Secretary Benjamin outlined, that President Biden and his team should host a White House conference of food, nutrition, and hunger and health by the year 2022. It's about time we make it happen. So they should do it with bipartisan support from Congress, with input and comments from the private sector, from nonprofits, from faith groups, research institutions, ordinary everyday citizens. I want to end with quoting my favorite philosopher, Briat Sabaran, a Frenchman. The, in 1826, he said, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. But he said something more important. The future of the nations will depend in how they will feed themselves. People, let's make sure that the way we feed America is the way that is going to give hope for a, the better America we all want. I think it's time we'll come together finally to break bread and build longer tables first lady jill biden told me food is love i do believe that is no more important issue than food let's make it happen secretary glickman all to you 
Well, thank you. I, I think when you look at the words enthusiasm and commitment in the dictionary, I'd say to everybody watching, the name Jose Andres appears there. So we, we should be proud that he is he is certainly with us. So um, now I have the opportunity to introduce the current secretary, current and former secretary of agriculture, who at this stage is the second, has the second longest term of any secretary in modern history, Tom Vilsack. And I think that uh, we'll see a, a, a recorded uh, a piece that he uh, talks about this issue. So if the team would put that on, that would be great. Thank you for convening today to discuss such an important topic that is top of mind at the United States Department of Agriculture, as well as to many families across the nation. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic led to rising food and nutrition insecurity and further exacerbated the worries of millions of moms and dads struggling to get by to put food on the table for their families. Thanks to President Biden's American Rescue Plan, we were able to act quickly to bring substantial relief to the American people and get nutrition assistance in the hands of millions of food insecure Americans. When the American Rescue Plan was first enacted, 14% of families reported that they sometimes or often did not have enough to eat, which was an incredibly high number. Now this rate overall, and among those with children, as, is at its lowest level during the pandemic. That's because with the American Rescue Plan, we were able to extend higher SNAP benefits to millions of low-income individuals through the end of September and connect more households to vital nutrition benefits. The Biden-Harris administration also reformed the SNAP emergency allotment policy to better target the neediest households. And we've rapidly expanded online purchasing, extended benefits to struggling college students, and increased flexibility in application procedures and rules. We launched the largest child summer feeding program in our nation's history with the Summer EBT Benefit Program. And we extended a set of nationwide waivers for the school year to help support strong and successful reopening of our schools. Importantly, we've also extended these waivers in a way to refocus our nutrition standards and encourage schools to serve the highest quality meals possible with additional resources that they now have available while at the same time recognizing the need for some appropriate flexibility as we continue to deal with pandemic-related supply issues and school nutrition professionals readjusting their operations as well. We've expanded resources to mothers and young children to purchase healthy, fresh foods, and we've delivered badly needed nutrition aid to U.S. territories. That's one of the reasons why we're in the process of rebranding our WIC program, not just as a nutrition program, but also as a public health program. The American Rescue Plan also increases food available for distribution through food banks and nonprofits to help feed families in need, and at the same time supports farmers by purchasing their products. Now, we've started a lot of new opportunities here at USDA, but we're looking forward to celebrating the 10th anniversary of My Plate, which provides guidance in terms of healthy meals. And we're hoping to highlight many of the tools now available to families so they can make healthy choices. With all of these efforts, we've showcased that when we invest in providing bold solutions, we do so to make a difference. And we can work closely together toward the goal of ending food and nutrition insecurity in America. This is a goal we all share together in achieving. Because whether we're in a pandemic or not, all kids in America should have access to the nutritious foods they need to learn and grow and for adults to contribute to our growing economy. I was pleased to see the task force support for the Modernized Thrifty Food Plan. The Modernized Thrifty Food Plan is an investment in our nation's health, economy, and security. Ensuring low-income families have access to a healthy diet helps prevent disease, supports our children in classrooms across America, and reduces health care costs, and does much, much more. And the additional money families will spend on groceries helps grow the food economy, creating and supporting thousands of new jobs along the way. As Congress considers the President's Build Back Better agenda, including his American Families Plan, I look forward to how we can build back better towards a more sustainable, resilient, equitable, and prosperous future. 
including in ways in which we can advance food and nutrition security for Americans with new nutrition investments to continue to drive down hunger, especially child hunger, making long-term investments in healthy meals in schools. It's just not enough to return to where we were prior to the pandemic. As we build back better than we were before, we must tackle not only food insecurity, but also nutrition insecurity. USDA's core nutrition programs are the most far-reaching, powerful tools available to ensure that all Americans, regardless of race, ethnicity, or background, have access to healthy, affordable food. We're committed to building on these programs and making strategic investments to ensure a food system that is fair, equitable, affordable, and beneficial to all. I'm really thankful for the important work you're doing to utilize the best research and to come to consensus on actions that will make a meaningful difference. Together, we can reach closer to our goal of ending food and nutrition insecurity in America. And I look forward to working with you to reach that goal. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're located. My name is Melissa Baton Shepherd. I have a company called MS Health Strategies LLC, and I'm a consultant for the Bipartisan Policy Center. I'd like to thank Secretary Vilsack and his team for these remarks. And I've been privileged to work with the Bipartisan Policy Center in supporting their esteemed Food and Nutrition Security Task Force. And today I'm thrilled to be leading four task force members in a discussion about the recommendations in our first brief, Improving Food and Nutrition Security During COVID-19, the Economic Recovery, and Beyond. If you registered for today's event, you should have received a link to download our brief in your inbox this morning, or you can find it on BPC's website on the event page. I'm going to start our discussion by briefly introducing the four panelists. We have Dr. Iuma Anelli, who is the director of the Center for Healthy Weight and Nutrition at Nationwide Children's Hospital. She is a board certified general pediatrician and professor of clinical pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. Dr. Anelli oversees a comprehensive pediatric obesity center with activities that include advocacy prevention, medical weight management, and adolescent bariatric surgery. Dr. Anelli also directs the Primary Care Obesity Network, which provides obesity-related training resources and community integration for 21 primary care practices in Central Ohio. Dr. Anelli has a medical degree and a Master's of Science in Epidemiology. Our next panelist is Christina Herman, who is the Director of the Underserved Populations Team at Amazon building programming for low-income customers to increase access to and awareness of the services and features available, including grocery and payment services. Her journey with this team began by enabling SNAP EBT purchasing, a program that started as a one-state pilot in 2019 and is now available in 26 states plus DC. Christina has a JD and an MBA and has had several roles at Amazon since joining the company in 2006. Christina has three children, all of whom say their mom's job is to make food accessible to people who need it. Our next panelist is Dr. Robert Parlberg. He is an emeritus professor of political science at Wellesley College, an associate in the sustainability science program at the Harvard Kennedy School and an associate at Harvard's Weatherhead Center. He has a PhD in international relations from Harvard University. His latest book is entitled Resetting the Table, Straight Talk About the Food We Grow and Eat, and was published in February 2021. Uh, Pamela Schwartz is our fourth panelist. She joined Kaiser Permanente in 2001 and serves as the Executive Director for Community Health. In this position, Pam leads Kaiser Permanente's comprehensive approach to transforming the economic, social, and policy environment so that people across the nation have access to affordable and healthy food. She also leads Kaiser Permanente's national strategy to address crucial social factors that affect people's health, including housing, social isolation, digital divide, and financial security. As one housekeeping note, I'm gonna ask a few questions of our panelists first, but we have saved some time for questions from the audience. So if you have a question for our panel, please submit them using the live chat function on YouTube or on Facebook or through Twitter using the hashtag BPC Live. 
Please state your name and affiliation when submitting a question and note if your question is directed to a specific panelist. So to get started, I'm going to invite each of our four panelists to provide some opening comments and also interested in your thoughts as to which of the task force high level recommendations, which you heard Secretary Veneman went through the nine recommendations in her comments. So which of those recommendations do you find most important or most timely? And I will start with Dr. Anelli first. Thank you, Melissa, and um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, so this policy brief, when you look at our recommendations, for me, there are three big themes that run through it, right? One is our um, increasing access to food. The second is not just food, but the quality of the food. Um, we're also looking at targeting populations who are at greatest risk. And we know those populations were also at greatest risk for COVID. And then the third is how do we do this work? And one way is by integrating multiple sectors, particularly we talk a lot about healthcare. I am a pediatrician and it's clear to me that what we need to do has to go beyond the four walls of the clinic. So what are the short-term or long-term uh, recommendations and which ones are important? I absolutely think a short-term and important one is convening the White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, Hunger, and Health. It will galvanize the field. It will bring together our stakeholders. And I think it will allow us to look at some of the recommendations from this brief um, as well as the two bipartisan um, council groups that are coming up. Um, I have to talk about um, looking at um, giving some of our federal agencies the flexibility and being nimble to react to emergencies too. That is really important. We've got a lot of experience from COVID and that experience can help us target these actions in the short term. Um, as well as focusing on social determinants of health. If there's one thing COVID did, it blew that door open to force us to look at disparities and inequities in um, our society and to address them. Thank you, Dr. Anelli. Christina, which recommendations do you find most important and most timely? Sure, thank you, Melissa. It's been a pleasure to be part of this task force. Um, I, I think many of the recommendations in the brief represent synergies with the work my team leads at Amazon on behalf of underserved communities to improve access to food and nutrition. I do believe that the recommendation to enable the necessary technology infrastructure to modernize nutrition programs and ensure equitable access to nutrition stands at the forefront to make a meaningful impact in people's lives and in the efficacy of federal food and security benefits. Um, this is in addition to Dr. Nelly's comments and the rest of the recommendations, all of which I find incredibly valuable. Thank you. Dr. Perlberg, would you share some thoughts as to which recommendations you find most important and most timely? Yes, uh, thank you, Melissa. First, I'd like to say that uh, I've admired the work of the Bipartisan Policy Center for quite some time, and it's a pleasure and an honor to participate with all of you in this task force. Our most important recommendation in this first brief, uh, I believe, is our call for a new bipartisan White House conference on food, nutrition, hunger, and health in 2022. We had such a conference on poverty and hunger back in 19. 69, and it led to a dramatic and successful improvements in poverty-focused food security policies like SNAP and the WIC program. Uh, but our dietary health challenges today extend far beyond uh, poverty and hunger. Adult obesity rates in the United States today are three times as high as they were in the 1960s. Uh, they've tripled for, and this is for non-poor uh, as well as poor Americans. Even before the pandemic, obesity was contributing to 300,000 American deaths a year, according to the National Institutes of Health. We, can, we can't address this uh, broader dietary uh, health challenge 
without bringing uh, everyone uh, into the room, including nutrition experts, including medical doctors, including people from uh, food companies and, and the food service uh, sector. And a bipartisan White House uh, conference uh, will provide uh, an appropriate uh, way to do that, and it won't cost much money. Thanks, Dr. Perlberg. Pam, would you like to share some opening comments and your thoughts yeah. on which recommendations are particularly important and timely? Thank you, Melissa. And I am so honored to be part of the task force and to participate in this important conversation. And I agree with Dr. Nelly, it, it, health is about what happens outside the walls of medicine as well. And so as it relates to the recommendations, at, at Kaiser Permanente, we're taking a really close look at how the interventions promoting food as medicine can improve health outcomes and, and decrease costs. So we're actively evaluating interventions such as SNAP enrollment, medically tailored meals, produce prescriptions to understand what works and under what conditions conditions. And one way for healthcare to support this work is to share what we're doing to address food and, and nutrition insecurity and how we're evaluating our interventions to best meet the needs of our members and patients. And so by evaluating these policies, we can strengthen the existing evidence and identify interventions that have the greatest, most sustainable impact on health and also on cost in, in both the short term and the long term. So we've been rolling up our sleeves, really trying to help build the evidence and deploy the most impactful interventions. And we're also trying to understand the role of healthcare in nutrition security so that we can be part of the solution in a meaningful way. We've also been identifying partners. This was said in some of the opening remarks of, of the leaders of the task force. We're trying to identify partners at the national level and state level because like what was already said, we know that far too many people in this country go to bed hungry and that addressing food insecurity requires all hands on deck. Thanks, Pam, and thanks to all of our panelists for your opening comments. Um, I now have several questions related to the impact of COVID-19 on food insecurity. As you know, and as Bill Hoagland and several of our task force co-chairs shared in their opening remarks, estimates of food insecurity in 2020 were released by USDA last week. And the USDA data, USDA data found that there was no significant change in food insecurity between 2019 and 2020, despite the pandemic. However, other surveys have found increases, particularly in the early months of the pandemic, and there are variations uh, based on the time of the year you're looking at. So page 18 of the task force brief states that the task force believes that the enormous investments by the federal government, the charitable food system, the food industry, nonprofit organizations, and other stakeholders uh, were pivotal in addressing the alarming increase in need for food assistance caused by COVID-19 and the impact on the economy. And it was pivotal in stemming what could have been an even more dramatic increase in food insecurity and other adverse impacts on our society. And the task force estimated that more than $35 billion were provided in federal funding to support food access through COVID-19 relief legislation. So Dr. Perlberg, I'm gonna to turn to you first and then to our other task force members. Can you help us make sense of these various estimates of food insecurity, including USDA's findings that there was no significant change between 2019 and 2020? Yes, uh, I, I don't think we have a data controversy here. Uh, prior to last week's USDA report, we actually didn't know if food insecurity had increased in the first year of the pandemic or not. It's because we were relying on results from another survey that did not have a pre-pandemic baseline. This was the, the Household Pulse Survey that was administered for the first time in April, 2020. So it caught variations once the pandemic had begun, but it couldn't compare pandemic to pre-pandemic conditions. In contrast, the USDA Household Food Security Survey has been administered annually since the 1990s. So we have a long, strong baseline for comparisons. And it shouldn't have been surprising uh, to, to see no significant increase in household food insecurity overall in 2020 compared to, to 2019. Given all the things that have been mentioned already, we ramped up uh, private uh, charity, we ramped up federal food assistance programs, and uh, Congress voted to uh, ramp up uh, cash transfers. Uh, to individuals and uh, to households uh, in an unprecedented way. And, and, and these were all bipartisan efforts, uh, by the way, and we should be celebrating 
uh, last week's USDA survey results as evidence that uh, that uh, they mostly succeeded are are hastily constructed. It was an improvisation, but our hastily constructed uh, pandemic uh, food safety net uh, mostly held together. Yes, there were long lines at the food pantries, but that uh, meant that the food was there. So uh, I don't think we have a data controversy. I think we can we can move on uh, to our other recommendations uh, without worrying too much about uh, these different survey results. Thanks, Dr. Prober. And Pam, do you have any thoughts as to what role the benefit increases provided by the COVID recovery legislation and other private sector actions played in stemming what could have been much more significant increases in food and nutrition insecurity? I, I think I, I would agree with what uh, what was just said in that, well, well, first of all, we know that the data collection on food insecurity is complex. And also uh, that, that USDA recommended that more research is needed to understand the dynamics. And, and we agree with that. But what was already said is, is we saw government programs such as SNAP, WIC, Pandemic EBT increase. And those may have helped, just as Dr. Prabler said. And also the report um, indicated that food insecurity remained flat, but we also know that far too many people in this country go to bed hungry. So we need to continue our efforts to support and strengthen, strengthen the federal nutrition programs. Um, so I think I'm just agreeing with what was, what was just recently said. I have, um, it's just a ditto, I, I agree. Thanks, Pam. And to elaborate on the findings from USDA, as it's been stated, there were two groups that did experience significant increases in food insecurity, and those were households with children and Black non-Hispanic households. Um, and these households were more likely to experience food insecurity in the first place. And so these findings point to the potential for widening of existing disparities. So Dr. Anelli, I'm going to turn to you next. Uh, given that you work at a children's hospital, you must have seen firsthand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on children and families. So based on your experience, can you tell us what do you think is driving these increases in food insecurity and how will the task force recommendations benefit children and families in particular? Thank you, Melissa. Um, it, it is this heartening right, that finding that we're seeing higher rates among our children, families with children and uh, people of color. Um, I, a hungry child is, in school is inattentive. And we know through studies that um, when you live with food insecurity, you're more likely to be sick, to be hospitalized, and you know, COVID kind of laid it out for us. But the question you have is what led to that? You know, why are we seeing that in that population? And it's complex. I actually think that the primary reason is poverty, which in itself is a complex topic, right? Children who live in families where you have unemployment or underemployment, which we saw a lot of in the last year, um, are at higher risk for food insecurity. Um, and, and I think that if we um, look at poverty and we look at other social determinants of health, so housing, transportation, very little changes for these families, right, will keep them into um, favoring other, other items that they need as a household, like paying for, for health or instead of, of paying for food. So it's a complex picture. And I believe that um, when you look at our recommendations, there are a couple of things that stand out that will help us for future emergencies like this. One is, again, increasing accessibility and availability in the federal feeding programs. We know they work. The um, National School Lunch Program was a hit. My patients said that to me all the time. And that is one program that we can continue if we have the political will to do so. We definitely need to extend um, program flexibilities and waivers. I said this earlier on, give USDA the the, the authority to be able to respond quickly as we did with COVID, and then to keep some of the changes that we, we did. For instance, fruits and vegetables, increasing the amount from $11 to like $35 a month per person. Um, definitely, um, we need to look at the research and evaluation. So it's helpful to listen to Pam talk about that and to support the infrastructure that exists for us to do that both within um, families with children 
and in our communities of color. Thanks, Dr. Anelli. And Christina, I'm going to turn to you next since you work with underserved populations in your role at Amazon. Can you tell us what policy recommendations do you think are most important in addressing health equity and tightening the growing disparities in food insecurity? There's so many. It's hard to answer that question, frankly. There's so many different factors that lead to food and nutrition insecurity. And I think the brief does a really amazing job of tying together all of those different factors across the recommendations. Um, I think the, the push for better technology and um, uh, the, the work that, that Amazon has done with both government and nonprofits, so cutting across the three sectors, has really proven out that we need to maintain those partnerships across those three sectors and really innovate together on behalf of the customer in the framework that this brief puts forward so that we can solve food and nutrition challenges across our country, not only during a pandemic or other similar emergency, but overall, I, I think the improvements that we see um, need to be maintained even during non-crisis times. Um, attaching to that, um, further research on what exactly is nutrition and security and how do the social determinants of health play into that and how do we use technology to solve those problems. I think all of those come together in this brief as um, a holistic recommendation to improve lives in our communities in the future. Thanks, Christina. And one of the unique characteristics of BPC's task force is the diversity in its membership from across the political spectrum and from both the private and the public sectors. So given that each of you largely represent different sectors, I'd like to invite you to share what you, your organizations, or your industry at large have done to address food and nutrition security caused by COVID-19 and how the task force recommendations could further help to close gaps. So Pam and Dr. Anelli, I'll start with you two first. Um, since both of you largely come from the healthcare sector, can you share from your perspective, what has been the role of the healthcare sector in addressing food and nutrition security and share a little bit about what your organization has done. And, and also, can you elaborate a little bit further on the task force recommendations for strengthening healthcare and community connections and why these recommendations are so important? So Pam, we'll start with you first and then Dr. Anelli. Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll um, say a little bit about what we have done, and then I'll say a little bit about the potential of what the role of healthcare is. Um, so what, what we've done, building on our long history of obesity and diabetes prevention, our, our food and security work is one effort within a broader social health strategy. And this is where we're aiming to elevate social health to the same importance as physical and mental health. And so about a year ago, or during our world, um, we surveyed our members and asked them about their social needs. And we found that over 30% experienced some type of food insecurity. We also saw that people who report food insecurity were two and a half times more likely to report fair or, or poor, both physical and mental health. So since then, we've been building a portfolio of interventions in response. And, and there are three main interventions that we've been expanding during the pandemic that, that, I, that I wanna mention. One is SNAP and then medically tailored meals and produce prescriptions. So just before the pandemic, we saw an opportunity to help our members in, enroll in SNAP. And so we launched and, and evaluated an innovative, inexpensive texting approach to outreach to our low income um, members to help them apply for SNAP. And we combine that with phone support for households who needed extra help. And in the first year, we were able to reach out to over 1.2 million households. And so far we've helped 85,000 members across eight states apply for SNAP benefits. And so through this experience, we learned quickly that text messages from your healthcare provider are remarkably simple, they're inexpensive, they're cost effective, and, and they can quickly help people in need um, get food assistance. And that there's a role for healthcare in connecting our members or patients to government programs like SNAP. We've also experienced the, the benefits, um, what was said by Christina of the online application platform, or, or even the possibility of even more benefits. We, there is Get CalFresh in California to help enroll in, in, in SNAP, and, th and that does not exist in other states. Um, and what's been already said, we know that SNAP helps feed families, it helps put money in people's pockets to pay for other things, and it also helps put money in the local economy and uh, decrease healthcare costs. And we're looking at something similar with WIC. But I wanna mention two other things that I, th that I think are important. 
two other initiatives that help um, people access healthy food to deal with specific medical conditions. And this is also, these also contribute to the food as medicine movement, which we're seeing gain momentum across the nation. And the first is medically tailored meals. And so when we talk to leaders in the field, some of whom are on this task force, and we ask them what healthcare could do to address food insecurity and nutrition, they didn't miss a beat in telling us that we should be uh, deploying medically tailored meals, but not only the intervention, they told us that we need to build the evidence of what works and under what conditions. So we launched four studies with patients recently discharged from the hospital with chronic conditions. And we did this just as COVID was starting. So back in the spring of 2020, and many of our patients had diabetes and, and some had COVID. Um, and this supports healthy eating post discharge, but it also helps the members, uh, the patients stay safe at home during their recuperation. And of course, the intent is also that this intervention um, decreases the cost in healthcare. And so far, we've had 2,000 patients, over 120,000 meals served, and we've intentionally created studies to help inform the evidence. So, looking at things like the duration of weeks of meals, the number of meals a day, do you need nutrition counseling, do you feed the household, and of course, which disease categories lead to cost savings. And I'll say one, um, one thing briefly about a second intervention that's newer, and this is produce prescriptions, because this is a promising food as medicine in innovation, and, and it can help bridge the gap between healthcare and food systems. It's practical, practical scalable, sustainable, affordable, and it, it combines healthy food prescriptions and, and aims to improve health outcomes, but also quality of life and equity. And this has been on our radar for quite some time, but the evidence is even more sparse here than it is for medically tailored meals. There's also questions about how do you pay for it as, as healthcare and how do you find scaling partners in an organization of our size? So we're just about to begin a trial to test produce prescriptions with other members of the task force and, um, and providing uh, healthcare, um, or sorry, produce prescriptions, so healthy food boxes, uh, combined with uh, uh, nutrition education to people with diabetes who are also food insecure. And we're super excited about this trial because it will not only contribute to the evidence, but also to the national dialogue about the role of healthy food in, in improving health outcomes and cost. And we're doing this in partnership, more studies like this in partnership with Rockefeller, where we're looking at other studies, um, not in, inside our walls, but outside our walls and in, in communities really to help roll up our sleeves and build the evidence here. Dr. Anelli, I'll let you add from your perspective as well. Yeah, so um, at Nationwide Children's Hospital, we are doing um, quite a number of things Pam's talked about. And I'm aware, uh, based on our partnership and discussion with the Children's Hospital Association, that a lot of children's hospitals are doing key things that are target targeting social determinants of health or social drivers of health. So we have taken the approach that they're two things we could do. What can we do in the hospital? And what can we do outside the hospital in the community? So in a hospital, you start by training um, your staff and the medical doctors um, on these topics. We also screen. So we screen everyone and we've created a clinical decision pathway that allows us to respond to those responses in real time. Um, a hospital has strategically focused on hiring staff that can work with families and support them both in the community and in the clinics. And so we're talking about social workers, uh, community health workers, disease managers, or care coordinators. And that's key. You have to have the personnel in order to do um, the activities that we, we, we're doing. In the community, it's all about partnership, right? We are an anchor institution, but you cannot go it alone. You have to partner with the right people, right, in the community. And we have two big uh, public health, uh, population health initiatives. Our Healthy Neighborhood Healthy Family Program, if you're not aware of it, Google it. It is um, remarkable. We just don't focus on food insecurity. We also look at housing and transportation and jobs right, employment. Um, and then the newer one, which is the pediatric vital signs, where obesity is one of the indicators that we're, we're targeting. I have to call out um, two, very quickly, two programs that we work with a nonprofit in a community called Local Matters. It's probably one of my favorite. Um, and, and we work with them on culinary medicine. We train our residents. It's key to 
to uh, make sure that the people coming up are more aware than I was when I was in medical school. And then uh, we also work with them on virtual cooking classes. And that is key, right? If you know how to cook, if you know how to, to buy food, um, diet quality kind of comes in. Thanks, Dr. Anelli. And before I ask Christina our next question, I just want to remind our audience that if you have a question for the panel, please submit them using the live chat function on YouTube or Facebook, or tweet them using the hashtag BPC Live and include your name and affiliation when submitting the question. And note if your question is directed towards a specific panelist, and we'll be getting to audience questions very shortly. So, Christina. Um, since you work for Amazon, which is both in the technology business and in the food business. So can you share a little bit about what Amazon has done to address food insecurity, particularly for underserved populations in the wake of COVID-19 and what you see as the role of the private sector specifically or, or more broadly um, in working with the government and ensuring access to healthy foods for underserved populations during public health emergencies and economic downturns? Absolutely. Um, the last uh, 18 months, I guess it's been, have been very busy for us. Um, we were one of the original pilot participants with the USDA in the online purchasing pilot for SNAP, um, which launched in one state in April of 2019. Um, fast forward to where we are today, uh, online purchasing for SNAP participants is enabled in 46 states plus Washington DC through Amazon, um, as well as a large number of other retailers. Every time I look at the USDA's website about online purchasing for SNAP, the number of retailers participating has grown, which just goes to show that um, the private sector is, is working hard to innovate on behalf of customers here to make sure that everyone has access to food. And that is at the core of what my team has done since the beginning of COVID, really working to make sure that there's equitable access to all kinds of food, including in particular nutritious foods for everyone, regardless of how they're paying, whether they're paying by SNAP or they have a debit or credit card. Um, we also obviously do home delivery, which is a great benefit um, during a pandemic, but also even outside of a pandemic, you know, going to the grocery store takes time. And for families that are working multiple jobs and juggling childcare and school schedules, um, going to the grocery store can be really challenging. Um, getting home delivery can save a lot of time and get more nutritious food to the table more quickly. Um, in addition, there are about 17 million people in the US who live in areas without a nearby supermarket. This means they often have trouble accessing nutritious food. They have challenges in transportation. Um, how do they carry heavy foods back to their homes? that sort of thing. Um, so we've been working closely with uh, local organizations to the point made earlier about the importance of local partnerships. We've been working closely with local organizations in support of their anti-hunger efforts to make sure that food is accessible in these communities, as well as in the communities that may be better off and have grocery stores directly within them. Um, Amazon is committed to making food accessible, offering customers convenience, time savings, and low prices across the board. That's for all customers. It's a very inclusive approach that we take. Um, so technology comes into play here in, um, in how we get food to people, but also just how we think about everything that all of the steps that it takes for people to get that food. How are they paying? How are they getting transportation? How is the food getting to their tables? How are they cooking? To many of the points made earlier, how, how are people learning to cook? Um, how do they make those meals healthier and safer for their families um, so that their families are getting the best out of the food that they have in their homes? All of this can be supported through technology and um, watching, watching the over the course of a pandemic, watching all the retailers step up and make food accessible through online purchasing, and then take that additional step further to make sure that it's nutritious food, to make sure that people of all demographics have access to solid nutrition has been a really important part of my work, but also the partnerships across different retailers and the nonprofit sector as well. Thanks, Christina, and thank you to the audience members who have submitted questions thus far. Um, I want to thank Lois F. from San Francisco for her question for 
Pam Schwartz, who I believe it has already mostly been addressed, but the question was about what research Kaiser Permanente is doing to investigate the impact of food-related efforts to changes in food security. So thank you for that question, and thank you, Pam, for uh, largely addressing that question. I want to turn to another topic of nutrition and security, and we do have an audience question that's focus more on nutrition and security. So this task force is focused on both food insecurity as well as nutrition insecurity, which focuses on access, availability, and affordability of foods that promote well-being and prevent or treat disease. And research cited in the brief has shown that more than 60% of COVID-19 hospitalizations could have been prevented were it not for people having four common diet related conditions, including diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and heart failure. And so given the connection between these diet related conditions and severe COVID outcomes, the task force provides recommendations to address the topic of nutrition security. So there was a question from uh, Timothy Turner from Suwanee, Georgia, who asked about the definitions of food and nutrition security and why they are so critical. Um, Timothy had asked where, to, where these definitions can be found, believes a definition of food insecurity can be found on USDA's website, but there is no official definition of nutrition security. Um, and that is one of the task force recommendations. So Dr. Paulberg, I'll turn to you if you can elaborate a little bit more about why you think a definition of nutrition insecurity is so important and how will the recommendations of the task force help to address nutrition insecurity. Yes, thanks. I, I think moving to uh, an agreed definition of nutrition security is important because it will move uh, the conversation uh, beyond the historical uh, focus of the policy community on just poverty and hunger, on access to enough calories to avoid uh, undernutrition. That remains an important focus, but uh, Today, uh, very few Americans are seriously undernourished, while far too many uh, consume excess quantities of ultra-processed foods with added uh, sugar, salt, and fat that induce uh, obesity and lead to uh, serious dietary health problems with type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, cancer. As I said, before the pandemic, the NIH estimated that obesity was contributing to 300,000 uh, deaths a year in America. So uh, the, uh, the purpose for developing a definition of nutrition security is to move the conversation uh, toward, uh, toward dietary health uh, beyond uh, the uh, the problem of just getting enough calorie, calories. And I hope this task force can, uh, can underscore and re-emphasize the important emphasis that, uh, that, uh, that the Department of Agriculture and Secretary Vilsack have put on nutrition security from the very first days of the current administration. Thanks, Dr. Perlberg. And Dr. Nelly, your work is also focused on obesity and weight management. Would you like to elaborate on why you think addressing nutrition insecurity is so important and how the task force recommendations do that? Yeah, absolutely, Melissa. Um, we, there are a number of studies um, that have shown a relationship between diet quality, right, and um, not having enough food, so food insecurity in itself is related to obesity. And obesity in itself is a linchpin disorder. It comes, doesn't come alone. It comes with multiple serious comorbidities, both in adults and um, in children. So I, I think it's key and really important. And I actually think this is the right time for us as a community to look at diet quality. Um, we know, for instance, that the intake of sugar sweetened beverages in the country has dropped from a, above 10% to about 5%, right? And that's because people are becoming more aware. Um, we have more work to do with uh, processed foods, with increasing our fruits and vegetables, with looking at just key things like our eating patterns, right? And um, how we relate to food. So it is a complex area. And I, I believe that this is the right time. I do want to add one more thing when you think about obesity, um, particularly from a healthcare perspective, is that there's been a lot of misinformation about COVID. 
right? And I think they probably took a leaf from our weight loss supplement, uh, weight um, diet um, um, industry, because there is a lot of misinformation there. Um, and I, I feel positive that the recommendations, very specific if you read through the brief about key ways in which we can make a difference um, through programs that link healthcare with the community, and also looking at increased funding for uh, places like the Division for Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity at the CDC that work with states and local cities um, to implement programs. Thanks, Dr. Anelli. As our event is coming close to an end, we've received a few more questions. I'm gonna read them off and then invite each of our panelists to provide some brief closing remarks and address any of the, these questions. So we have a question from Roger from OFW Law in Washington, DC, who asked about whether the task force identified administrative changes to be made in the operation of food assistance programs. Uh, the short answer to that is yes, and I will invite any task force members to elaborate on that. Uh, Leah Martin asked, to what extent should solutions to food nutrition security be distinguished by location? For example, do rural and urban approaches rural or different areas require different approaches. And then Andrea from Baltimore, Maryland asked, how can grocery stores and farmers markets be brought into more communities to alleviate lack of access to nutritious food, such as food deserts? So um, I will start uh, with you, Pam. We only have about a minute or two left. So if you could keep your remarks brief, but we'll invite you to provide any closing remarks or responses to these questions. Okay. So I want to I want to um, answer the question about local and just to say that we need to make sure as we're creating and evaluating these interventions that we have equity in mind and that we're talking to the people who we're developing these programs for. So really paying attention to the lived experience and and understanding the barriers and co-creating the solutions in partnership with community. And then for us, where we're an organization at scale, we need to leverage our scale in partnership with community to make sure we're getting the right things to the right people. At, at the right time. And in closing, I'll just say there's quite a buzz in the field a, about what's possible here with the whole topic that we've been discussing today. And that, that's why we have so many people listening. And we're really trying to learn from others and also inform the field. And so this, this means sharing best practices, contributing to the science, but also listening to the people who we're trying to solve these, you know, co-create these, these solutions for. And so trying to have an eye on responding to the increased needs as a result of the pandemic. So getting much needed food out to people fast, but while also developing and deploying long-term solutions, creating access to healthy, affordable food at scale, creating better health, uh, health outcomes, and, um, and lower cost of care. Thanks, Pam. Christina? It, would it be fair for me to just say ditto to everything Pam just said, because she really summed it up so well. Um, just a, a quick remark in response to Andrea's question about grocery stores in food deserts. It's a real problem and, and we need a solution there. Um, I think the solution will come from um, true innovation as well as public private partnerships um, on top of listening to the community. I think that is a lot of times why grocery stores tend to fail in underserved communities is because they come in and they don't listen to the community and they're not speaking to the people who are actually there and shopping their stores. Um, so I look forward to greater innovation. I think the momentum being driven through the, the brief and all the conversations that have led up to the brief has been phenomenal. And I think we can change the future working together as a group and with the amazing brain trust of all of the people that we are working to serve here. Thanks, Christina. Dr. Anelli. I, I'm not sure there's much to add. I absolutely agree with Christina and Pam. Uh, it was heartwarming how we came together as a society to care for each other, to uh, be uh, more aware of the inequities that exist in our society, and to have a drive to address them. And I think this brief pulls out those elements and gives us an opportunity to begin the discussion. Last but not least, Dr. Perlberg. Thank you. Uh, the question about uh, food deserts interests me because I took quite a bit of time in my new book uh, titled Resetting the Table, Investigating the Food Deserts Claim. And the most recent research indicates that uh, obesity trends in America have been driven less by a lack of access to healthy foods than by 
too much access to a swamp of unhealthy foods. The, the food swamp literature is now starting to overtake uh, the food desert literature in understanding our poor dietary health, but don't have time to go into that. Thank you, Dr. Perlberg, and thank you to all of our panelists. So on behalf of the Bipartisan Policy Center, I'd like to thank all of today's speakers, including our Food Nutrition Security Task Force co-chairs for their leadership in this initiative and for their opening comments, uh, Secretary Glickman, Secretary Veneman, Chef Jose Andres, and Leslie Saracen. I'd like to thank Secretary Vilsack and his staff for the keynote address. Also, thank you to our panelists, Dr. Anelli, Christina Herman, Dr. Perlberg, and Pam Schwartz. Uh, thank you to all 18 members of the Food and Nutrition Security Task Force and their staff for their expertise and engagement in the development of the policy brief. Thank you to our audience members for attending today's event and for your questions for the panel. I understand we had more than 700 people register today. Finally, I'd like to thank the BPC staff and consultants whose work was so pivotal in development of the brief and for making today's event go very smoothly. Um, as Bill mentioned in his opening comments, today's brief was the first in a series of three from this task force. The second brief will be focused on strengthening the child nutrition programs. The BPC will be hosting an event to release this brief in the coming week. So if you registered for today's event, you should receive an email for, with more information about the second brief. I hope everyone enjoyed today's event. If you have not yet reviewed our brief, I hope you'll please take a moment to do so. You can find it in the email that you received with the link to today's event or on BPC's website on the event page. So thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's event and have a wonderful day.